We'll conclude our discussion of mismatch by looking at the impact of hygiene on our microbiota and its consequences for health and disease. The ideas here were stimulated by seeing certain patterns both in space and in time that signaled that changes in our microbiota might be affecting the incidence of autoimmune disease. There may be particular roles for worms in this relationship and therefore we're going to look at in a bit more detail at how worms might be interacting with the immune system. It is possible that some autoimmune diseases might be treatable with worms, but it is a risky trade-off and evidence so far is mixed on how effective it might be. The clinical trials have not yet been successful. So let's return for a moment to the Industrial Revolution in that second epidemiological transition. At that point, when we went through urbanization into modern cities, we entered an environment with soap, with washed food, with less mud, and with chlorinated water. We have less oral fecal transmission and less contact with farm animals. At the same time, antibiotics reduced our exposure to all kinds of bacteria and anti-helminthics, that is, drugs against worms, and clean water have reduced our exposure to parasitic worms. We encounter less Helicobacter, Mycobacterium, Salmonella, Toxoplasma, and Hep A than we did previously. So our microbiota has been simplified. It's less varied because our environment is cleaner. Now what are the consequences? If we look at a map of the world where we have good information and we contrast the post-industrial countries here in blue with large populations, countries where most people are living outside of cities in red, what we find is that post-industrial countries have high rates of type 1 diabetes and few parasites. And these countries in red that have large rural populations and poor access to antibiotics have low rates of type 1 diabetes and high rates of diseases that are caused by worms. If we look in time, over the last half of the 20th century, infectious diseases declined rapidly in incidence. So this is hepatitis A, tuberculosis, mumps, measles, rheumatic fever, all declining. At the same time, immune disorders rose. Multiple sclerosis, Crohn's disease, type 1 diabetes, and asthma all rose dramatically in the last half of the 20th century. So there's an inverse relationship between the incidence of infectious disease and immune pathology. This prompted the idea that autoimmune diseases and other immune pathologies could be mediated by worms. And people began to do experiments on worms. Here we have the particular kind of worm and the autoimmune disease that was investigated experimentally. So schistosoma has been shown to uh, reduce the risk of autoimmune encephalomyelitis and Graves thyroiditis. Trichura suis has been shown in mice to reduce the incidence of inflammatory bowel disease and so forth. So there has been some experimental evidence in mice showing that treatment with worms or with worm eggs can reduce the risk of autoimmune disease. So these experiments were stimulated by those patterns in space and time. Now, that suggested that one could carry out therapy with pig whipworms in humans. The choice of the pig whipworm was led by the idea that you needed something that would not be uh, itself a pathogen in humans, but might produce enough interaction with the immune system to trigger the uh, protective response. So preliminary trials of a cocktail of pig whipworm eggs produced some mixed results in people with ulcerative colitis. Then large-scale clinical trials were implemented. They were called off in 2013 when those who were on the treatments were not doing any better 
than those who are on the placebos. A case control study of people with and without naturally occurring parasitemias indicated that having parasites in your body slowed the progress of multiple sclerosis and treating the, par the parasites accelerated it. Here uh, we have on the x-axis time in months, so this whole period here, it's five years to there, and then it's about another uh, two and a half years out to here. The black line is people who are uninfected. The red line is people who are infected. The blue line is people who have been treated for their infection. And the y-axis is the number of lesions detected in the brain that are characteristic of multiple sclerosis. So there are really two things to see here. One is that the patients entering were either uninfected or infected, but they all had the preliminary symptoms of multiple sclerosis. Those who were uninfected rapidly developed symptoms. Those who were infected were much slower. They hardly developed any further symptoms at all of multiple sclerosis. However, these are natural worm infections. These are not therapeutic egg uh, treatments with cocktails. And so some of the patients really began to suffer from their worm infections. They were pathogenic and serious. They were treated for their worm infections here. And as soon as the worms were cleared out, you can see that their symptoms of multiple sclerosis rapidly rose to about the same level of those people who had lacked worms right from the beginning. So there is some suggestion that worms are providing protection against autoimmune disease. That leads to the issue of how they might be interacting with the immune system. It might be simple homeostasis, so the immune response produced by the worm infection might simply be overlapping with something like the tissue repair response. It could be a downregulation of the immune response by the host to avoid inflammatory damage in a sustained infection in such a broad way that allergic and autoimmune reactions are also dampened. It could be that by elevating circulating antibody levels, both specific and nonspecific antibodies, in response to the worm infection would dilute the allergen-specific antibodies and saturate reception, uh, receptors on mast cells and eosinophils. And it could also be that there was interference with specific signals by worms to evade and suppress the immune system with reduction of immune pathologies as an unintended byproduct. That is the one that I think that is most likely because worms have been under strong natural selection to be able to suppress the immune system so that they can stay in the body of the host and continue to reproduce. All four processes are possible. They have not yet been ruled out. The fourth seems to be the most likely. However, worm therapy is a risky kind of trade-off. In the tropics, worm infections increase susceptibility to tuberculosis, AIDS, malaria, and other infectious diseases. So giving people worms in the tropics is a bad idea because it could very well make them die for other reasons. Worm infections also reduce the protection offered by vaccines. The symptoms of worm infections themselves can cause serious distress and they may become life-threatening. So although some individuals have reported improvements in the symptoms of an inflammatory bowel disease when infected by hookworms, hookworm infections themselves can produce serious pathology. So worm infection is a risky trade-off. Clinical trials have not yet been successful. Two phase two clinical trials that were using pig whipworm eggs to treat Crohn's disease were discontinued when the treatments were not doing any better than the placebos. It might be that worms really are mediating autoimmune disease, but that worm therapy is only effective when the worms can establish enduring infections and cause pathogenic effects themselves. Now, if that's the case, the cost-benefit balance of worm treatments must be looked at very carefully, and it may be that we are going to have to do something like domesticate worms or put them through a program, well, as we would with a virus, to try to produce 
an attenuated live virus, if we could produce an attenuated worm treatment, then that might be effective. So to summarize, our bodies co-evolved with a diverse microbiota with which we have had both positive and negative interactions. When those commensals are removed, our immune systems respond inappropriately and we get allergy, asthma, and autoimmune disease. Some mechanisms are now understood, but the search for therapies using biological agents has not yet been successful. So to conclude on the general problem of mismatch, our bodies are clearly mismatched so to a sedentary lifestyle, to a post-industrial diet, to a lack of exposure to parasitic worms, and to altered exposure to other microorganisms. Some of the resulting diseases, obesity, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, and type 2 diabetes, can be improved with diet and exercise. That should be the first line of defense. For others, the immune pathologies, effective therapies are desperately needed, but they are not yet available. Insights from mismatch may help to find them.